Welcome to All American People. I'm Donald Smith, producer and director of the program. And to my left is Greg Everett. Good seeing you, hey, Greg. Donald. Good to be Changing with you. Changing up a little bit. I love it. Um, yeah. Um, uh, of what normally happens. We should have done on. this more often. No. The ratings would have been through the roof. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt yeah. it. But the reason that uh, uh, I'm on this uh, camera and Greg's on the other one, uh, this is going to be our last week for a little while with uh, all American people. And we thought uh, we'd run some reruns of one of my favorite people that I had the opportunity to meet over the years. And we uh, got to uh, uh, interview him a few times, uh, is uh, Greg's uh, father. But before we do that, uh, Greg, why don't you uh, um, tell everybody what's happened in your life and why we're taking a little higher? Yes, absolutely. It's good stuff. I know, it is. Of course, uh, the sad thing was Dad passed away, but the great thing was that McLaren and I moved to Durham for about a year and a half, and while we were up there, we met a wonderful Conway girl who'd been up in the uh, Triangle for seven or eight years, and uh, we're blessed to get set up on a blind date by Jessica Sasser, a recent guest of the show, and ultimately got married in July of last year. As you know, you were one of our uh, right. groomsmen. And uh, we were blessed to uh, get pregnant and actually uh, recently delivered a son, James Holmes Everett, James Holmes Everett, who, um, who is um, just a lot, a lot of little things going on with, a, uh, with, a, with all pregnancies. So some wonderful things are happening. We're celebrating his life right now, and this was a great opportunity to highlight Dad and James together. Right. Well, we've got about a minute left uh, before we're going to toss it to uh, the interview with you, Dad. But uh, 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 we're going to take a pic. I think uh, we're yeah. going to show. We've got a shot James here right and, now of James. And, and, Absolutely. And, uh, he's uh, in in in. T in Television time, he's he's out of the hospital. But but while we're taping this, and the reason why we're doing it on this location, normally it's the other show we, that I do is at uh, River Talk. Uh, uh, James is in the hospital. That's right. Uh, and uh, but he's recovering. Good, but you think a couple of days with that? Absolutely, right. very definitely. Okay. By the time this airs, he is out and about. And All right. Well, we got 30 seconds before we're going to toss to it. And this, uh, the, real quickly, yeah. This the one we're going to toss to with this uh, was July with you. July 11 of 2007, almost exactly. Exactly four years ago, we were at uh, East of Chicago Pizza, and you can see the stuff in the background. It is a ball. Right. Any viewer. Well, we're going to take a look at this. it now. Tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit more about him, uh, um, Greg's father. But let's take a look back at that uh, interview that we did in uh, August. Uh, July 11, 2007. Zoom. There you have it. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at East of Chicago Pizza at 40th Avenue North and Kings Highway here in Myrtle Beach. We're focused on the life of Robinson Everett and we're visiting with the man himself. Good morning, Dad. <laughs> Great to have you in this morning. Well, I tell you, it's fun to be interviewed by my son and also to be in such a nice place as east of Chicago. This place is amazing, isn't it? To think, and of course, you, your only granddaughter for four and a half years, now one of two granddaughters, had her fourth birthday party here back uh, last September, which was very, very exciting. I wasn't here, but I bet she had a ball. I know, she had a ball. That's right, there are a lot of ski balls behind us and balls throughout. This place is amazing. They're open for lunch, I think from four to nine most days of the week and uh, even later on the weekends. Oh, Very I guess for lunch today. Yeah, 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 absolutely. If you'll stay around another five hours, you will, you okay. will. How exciting, Dad, the opportunity to get you in and of course uh, to focus on your life. Uh, we laid it out in the Myrtle Beach Herald over a three day period. I hope you're willing to come back with us tomorrow and possibly even the next day. I shall return. A little bit on the law. A little bit on, of course, your, your tenure as a judge for many years. And then, of course, teaching the law, which is probably pretty exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. When did you actually get your law license? 1950. 1950. Ancient history. Golly, Dad. Yeah, that is a heck of a long time. And was that something you thought about earlier on in life, that you wanted to be a lawyer, or did you thought of something else? I sort of fell into it. My mother and dad were both lawyers. and. Uh, so I knew I could get a job with them, uh, but I never really thought about it until I was in my last year at college, and this was up at Harvard. A friend of mine said, have you ever been to the Harvard Law School? I said, no, never have. He said, well, I'm going over there. Would you like to walk over with me? So we walk on over from our dormitory over to the Harvard Law School, and along the way I say, well, Ted, why are you going over to the law school? He said, well, I'm going to apply for admission. And we chatted, and he said, what are you going to do when you finish college? 
I said, I don't really have anything to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Right. He said, well, maybe you should apply for law school, or words to that effect. And so I thought, well, why not? I got over there, got an application form, as I recall. In any event, I went ahead and applied, got admitted, and there I was in law school. And having started, uh, I thought, okay. Three years later, I, I finished, and then I come back to North Carolina and take the bar. Right, right. It was sort of, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian, and I believe a lot in premeditation. So, <laughs> predestination. <laughs> predestination, that's right. <laughs> I think this was predestination. Yeah. Not yeah. premeditation. Not premeditation, but predestination. You know, you th obviously you think about, do you have a vivid memory of that, Dan? I've heard you tell that story before. I mean, can you actually picture Ted and being there in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I see that? I always wonder when we think back 60 years, you know, if you have memories. Do you have distinct memories of being at Harvard for college and then later for law school? Well, this I remember pretty vividly yeah. you know, as we walk over there. Right, but right. I can't. I can't really be sure exactly sure. what Sure. Oh, said. no, no, no. I understand. How about what, you know, no one ever asked you, or I, I, there's so many things folks could talk to you about there when they, when they get into a conversation with you. And since we've got a little time the next few days, do you have, what are some of your vivid memories from your six plus years spent there in Cambridge, Massachusetts between ages 16 and 22? Do you have any real vivid memories? I know I've read about a time where you and another guy challenged a real famous football coach in an eating competition or something. Share with viewers a little bit about that experience and maybe a jog some recollections for some of the viewers uh, in the area. Well, I had some funny experiences. Uh, I remember I had a Cuban roommate and uh, he and I went out to the Harvard-Yale football game, you know, in, in New Haven. Right. And uh, I remember uh, after the game, uh, we were going to be taking the train back up to, to Boston. Right. And uh, we apparently got diverted some way, so we get back into the train station, and the train had already left. Huh. And it was an ice-cold day. Uh, it wasn't a happy day because uh, Harvard had lost the game <laughs> pretty badly, so we weren't in a cheerful mood. It was freezing, and uh, we decided that apparently there was no place to, to stay and no transportation, so we decided to hitchhike. No, from yeah. New Haven, Connecticut back to Boston. Yeah, that was the idea. It was a very dumb idea. Right. So. My Cuban roommate and I uh, are standing there. We had a blanket. We're both huddled under the blanket. We get a ride part of the way, then we get a ride to another distance. I think we reached um, Westerly, Rhode Island about midnight. And we've been in the back of a truck. They dumped us out. And we're standing there freezing. And I mean freezing. Yeah. And so. <laughs> this is in the mid 40s. This is. Mid to late 40s. This would have been about 1946, I guess, yeah, somewhere yeah, along there, yeah. uh, 45, 46. So we're standing there, and finally a police car comes up, and we say, is there any motel that uh, is available, any place we can go to sleep, because we're going to freeze. Yeah. And the, uh, the policeman says, well, I don't know of anything. Everything's closed. So the only thing I know of is uh, we got room in the jail. <laughs> no. And he said the only trouble is if you go there, we have to lock you in. Oh no. So uh, we go. That's a lot better than freezing. Uh, I was in one cell with a guy who was totally drunk. He was intoxicated, and uh, I don't remember where my uh, Cuban roommate Pepe was. Anyway, we made it through the night, and they they let us out. Uh, fortunately, that was my only experience in jail, <laughs> and I did not get a, get a, a police record. That didn't show up on your record, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got home safely. That's one of two, one of the things I remember. The other thing you may be speaking of is um, an event. This was when I was in um, law school, right? And there was a football game coming up. I think it was Harvard Yale again. It was uh -huh. going to be played in Cambridge, and. Um, Yale had a coach who at one time had been at NC State. In any event, he was um, 
Oh, I can't think of his name. I can't think of his name either, but I've seen this story before in the Herald Sun, the Durham Herald Sun. Uh, I think I saw a piece on that. Yeah, this guy was really big, and the article about him said he could eat more than any two men alive. And my roommate at the time said, let's challenge him to eat. We're, it'd be sort of fun to do that. Right. Uh, let's ch challenge him on the night before the Harvard-Yale game yeah. to have an eating contest to see who could eat more. We'll try to get some elaborate restaurant in, um, in uh, Boston. Yeah, in somewhere. Boston. And so um, we were, we went over and as I recall, we were videotaped doing this challenge. I don't remember the details, but the uh, Harvard Crimson, the student newspaper, right. recited how these two law students were challenging the Yale coach to an eating contest. Oh, yes. And uh, <laughs> I remember that very vividly, because we got a lot of press. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The AP picked it up and carried it all over the country. And I remember the Durham paper was asking my mother what I ate, and uh, no. my father was not happy. He said, I didn't pay to send you up to law school to engage in this sort of stuff. But anyway, that was another memory of uh, my days there at Harvard. So I had some. I had a lot of fun. Uh, fortunately, wound up doing okay at, yeah. uh, at um, both Harvard. undergrad and law school. I, I think I was magna cum laude both, so I did a little, little bit of study. I anyway. think you must have. I think I remember not only your freshman year were you the the Wendell Scholar, I or the number one in your class, but then fourth out I don't of know four, if I was number one, but I got the scholarship. They got that uh, got that recognition, that honor. That's good. I'm glad you cleared that up. Again, we hear these stories, and of course, I did see. You're the, the official transcript that you were fourth out of a class of 445 there in law school, which was very impressive. And of course, something that is not lore, but is uh, whether you were first in your class there as an undergraduate. The exciting thing for a lot of folks and probably of great interest was that we've read that you had skipped a few grades in your early years, third, eighth, and 11th maybe and that you uh, you had gone off to prep school prior to attending Harvard, is well, that right? I, actually, what happened, um, I went through uh, Durham High School. Durham I, High School. I did skip a grade in high school, a grade in junior high. I started school when I was five and a half. The result was that I uh, got out of Durham High when I just turned 15. Uh, and I did okay there. I was salutatory, number two in the class. Right. So my parents said, you're too young to go to college, and we're going to send you somewhere. Uh, and they picked out a prep school up in New Hampshire, right. Phillips Exeter, which oh, is yeah. a great place, Phillips Exeter Academy. So I went up there for a year, and they let me graduate up there as well. They, I mean, treated me just as if I'd been there several is years. Is that right? Great. So, I'm a member of the class at Durham High School. I'm a member of the class of 1943 when I graduated. Had it not been for skipping grades, I would have graduated in the class of 45. So they invite me to their monthly luncheons and other events. So, right. so I have that benefit. And then in between, I can go to the uh, reunions of the class of 44 at Phillips Exeter. You are kidding, 43, 44, and 45. I get to go to a lot of reunions. That's amazing, dude. Yeah, I love it. That is amazing. And then I think you pointed out you started at Chapel Hill, and uh, the old story your mother, even your father had shared is that you began pledging a fraternity. Oh, I did. I was uh, an Alpha, Alpha Tall. Alpha Tall Omega. I became a uh, brother as an ATO. I started there just a few days after I finished at Exeter. Right. And was there for a few months. And uh, then my parents said, you're having too good a time. You're yeah. too close to home. And it was then that um, they uh, had me look into going elsewhere. And Phillips Exeter was sort of a feeder school for Harvard. Uh -huh. So I was able to get in Harvard. And that's why I wound up there spending six years as it developed. Amazing. I didn't get a New England accent, though. No, you don't have it, at least not here at East of Chicago. And, and as you pointed out early this morning, we are East of Chicago. That's, that's right. right. We are East of Chicago. This is a, a great place. I'm glad you <coughs> shared that, both those experiences of taking on the uh, football coach. Did he ever show up? 
to compete against you and your no, roommate. No, 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 no. He, he did not. He, he was not that happy about the idea of being... Uh, Challenged by two Harvard uh, uh, law students. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, the idea of being eating, being able to eat more than any two men alive that was uh, not appealing to him. Uh, he had said that though, or he had people. The newspaper had, oh, newspapers said yeah, to claim yeah. that yeah. that he could eat more than any two. I'm men. not sure that was yeah. a claim on his part. He right. was apparently a heavy eater, to put it mildly. Yeah. And uh, my uh, my friend and I. Uh, we're both, I won't say we were chow hounds, but we ate a lot. Yeah. And I remember my mother being asked by the Durham Herald about what I ate, and she explained that barbecue and lemon pie and sweet tea were my favorites. No, so, Dad, that, that, that is hilarious. Yeah. And you'd get a lot of that in Durham. I guess, I don't know if Bullock's Barbecue was around. When oh, you were, yes. Was oh, it yeah. when you were growing up? Uh, it started around 1952 or three. Okay, think, sure, so sure. It was not there until a little bit later, but right. pretty early on. Absolutely, a popular mainstay, which happens to be on the same street that you and Mom have lived on for 40 years. That's there right. on LaSalle Street. It's on uh, right off of Hillsborough Road there in Durham. I've eaten a lot of barbecue there. I know. And let me recommend it to anybody who comes to Durham, go to Bullock's Club. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If folks are coming to Myrtle Beach, we'd say East of Chicago or Villa. Villa Romana, the Italian restaurant of the year, of course, if they're heading up to uh, Durham. And a lot of folks travel in from all over the Triangle to go to Bullock's Barbecue, and probably all over the state to go to Bullock's Barbecue. They ship barbecue out. I know Phil Sotel recently spoke of getting some barbecue shipped out to Pasadena, California, from Bullock's Barbecue. Their barbecue is world-renowned. I remember when Ken Starr, the... Uh, it was a special prosecutor, you remember when, when Bill Clinton was right. having his problems. Ken Starr called me. He was from, he'd gone to Duke Law School. Right. And he asked me if I could join him, my wife and I could join him on a Saturday for lunch at Bullock's. He oh, was yeah. coming down for a basketball game. I remember, <laughs> the Clemson, uh, Clemson Duke game. Uh, that's right. That's so, right. So. We had Perry Tuttle up there with us for that, if you remember Perry Tuttle and his son Absolutely. came up for that, which was wonderful. You know, it's amazing when you think about all that time, and Durham is where you'd grown up, Dad. Is that right? That's right, all my life. I, I mean, I've been, lived away a lot. Right. But, uh, that's been my home. You know, when you think about living away the six years in Cambridge, and then there were about five years, what about 51 to 55? Let's say you finished law school, you came back to Durham in oh. 1950. Yeah, put a year in there when I was at home. It 50 was to first, 51. Yeah, I'd been away most of the preceding seven years. Right. Then I taught at Duke Law School. I think I was probably as young as anybody that was been a professor there. Oh yeah, I think I've seen something that Duke Law School put out in 2004 in a piece about your mother and her bequest there to the law school. They recognized you uh, in that piece in 2004 as the youngest law school faculty yeah. ever hired, even to the present, even, age 22. Well, you know, if you think about it uh, today, these days, it would be rare that someone would not only go through but finish law school by age 22, and of course even more rare that immediately after law school they'd be allowed to begin teaching other students. So, it was, it pretty was, rare occurrence probably back in 1950 when you joined the faculty. I have to say that was predestined because uh, no one would ever have predicted that would happen. And recently I got an award at, uh, at the time of graduation at Duke 50 years there of teaching. Yeah, that's right. And so I've got a lot of loyalty to the Blue Devils. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, as and also all, to the Tar Heels where I went to school for. Sure, sure. I was about to ask, you said 43 from, from uh, Durham High School, 40. Four from Exeter, 45 from Durham High School. No, 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 class of 45. I know, you would have been. Excuse me, of course, you can claim all those. Can you claim anything from Chapel Hill since you began school there? <laughs> I get fundraising requests because I'm still in the class of 48. Exactly, that's right, that's and right. Get, and, I get and I go to their reunions. Um, and also uh, at Harvard. Class of 48, even though you finished in 47. That's right, class of 50 at Harvard Law School. Uh, then later I got an LLM at Duke Law School, and that was 59. 59. Yeah. So. A lot of reunions. A lot of reunions there, Dad, all the way from 43 up to 59. That's, that's amazing. 
That's amazing. It's been exciting. I'm sure it has. Well, you know, we think about what was it in early age that spurned your interest in the law? Well, as I said, I hadn't necessarily planned to be a lawyer. Right, sure. But I had uh, two wonderful parents who were both pioneers in law. Um, huh. My uh, mother was one of the first women lawyers in North Carolina. And um, she had a marvelous career that began in 1920. Right. When she was admitted to the bar. She, by the way, was the daughter of a lawyer in Fayetteville, North That's Carolina. Right. She was admitted in 1920. She retired at the end of 1990. That's, I think, it's 70 years. That's right. And at the time she retired, she was the, I believe, the oldest practicing attorney in America. So I have my mother's example. My dad was one of the first five students to read law. I saw that at Mordecai. At Trinity College, which was the pre predecessor of Duke University. So uh, I can claim that he was, or he could have claimed that he was one of the first five law students at Duke Law School. Right, right. So in any event, uh, and he, he started about 1905 and died in his law office around 1992. 1971. So 71. 71, Excuse me. Right. No, 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 that's I'm fine. Sorry. You were thinking of your mother in 92. Excuse right. me. Yeah, yeah. Up. Sorry. But a, he had a, that's 60, Seven years? Yeah. Something like that. And uh, so having these wonderful parents who were enthralled by the law, oh, yeah. I think obviously had a subconscious effect on me and made me want to try to be uh, a public servant like they had been. My dad um, was a fine trial lawyer. He also was a legislator in the North Carolina. General Assembly, the legislature, for five different terms. But one of the things he did was take cases that were unpopular, difficult, representing underdogs. Mm -hmm. And um, he felt that everybody needed. Your father regularly represented underdogs. He represented a lot of them. He what are some them. examples of that? We've got about five minutes. What are some examples of? cases that your father took on that uh, may have been the ones that other people wouldn't take on? Well, he is a uh, white lawyer would uh, represent African Americans in some difficult situations uh, where they uh, could not get counsel. Uh, he uh, also had a very interesting case back in the 1920s involving a Jewish shopkeeper in Durham who had come in to pay his water bill. And he brought in uh, several hundred pennies. He decided to pay it all in pennies. And the guy who was there uh, at the counter for the city uh, was very unhappy. And he made some very anti-Semitic remarks. Uh, and of course, there was some anti-Semitism in our society at that time. And unfortunately, some of it still remains, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But in any event, uh, my... Uh, my father was retained by this particular shopkeeper to sue the city of Durham because their employee had made the anti-Semitic remark. And uh, the case, as I recall, was thrown out initially and then went to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And there, Chief Justice Walter Clark wrote a, an opinion that was really historic at the time, mm. very much cited, pointing out that People shouldn't be anti-Semitic. They're talking about one of the oldest cultures of the world, right. great tradition, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, sort of a, just extraordinary praise of the Jewish culture and the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's an example of a, a situation where my dad stepped in when no other lawyer would have had There's it. There's another one that I've read about, maybe at, where he had some some fi shots fired at his vehicle. Yeah, that's right. He. Uh, as I understand it, and I've heard this both from mother and dad, uh, when I was very young, mother was at home with me, I was a little baby, and my dad went up to, um, I believe it was Henderson, North Carolina, mm -hmm. from Durham, to represent an African American uh, young man who had been accused of uh, raping a white woman there. Mm. And that that was a capital offense at that time. That was a capital offense? Yeah. Rape was? Rape was. And uh, 
where it was a black-white situation, it was not that unusual to have a count, to have death penalty imposed. At least, it was more than theoretical, I'll put it that way. So he went up to um, defend him along with one or two African-American attorneys from Duke, from Durham. And um, they get up there and start the trial. And uh, my mother got a phone call from an Associated Press reporter saying, has Mr. Everett come home, gotten home? And she said, no, he hadn't gotten here yet. Why are you calling? What's going on? And the reporter said, well, the last report was people were shooting at him. And um, what happened was he left the courthouse with the two African-American attorneys. There was a mob outside, a crowd. He gets into his car tells them to jump in the back, get on the floor, and he takes off. And um, there was noise, either backfire or people shooting. And mm -hmm. uh, at least there was some indication there was people shooting. He came down to Durham, and then the question was whether they should go back the next day. And he told these attorneys, he said, we gotta go back. You know, we can't let people prevent you from doing your duty as attorneys. And even though their racial overtones and it's dangerous, dangerous for all of us. We're going to go back, and they did. I think they lost the case, not too surprisingly, but uh, I don't believe there was a death penalty imposed. But I, I think the the, circum the willingness to go back into the uh, into that situation is indicative of of his courage and. Uh, his determination. One other thing that's sort of interesting about my father. Those are great words, Dad. We're going to have to break right now, but uh, let's open up tomorrow morning if you're willing to come back with us tomorrow and uh, open up real quick with your dad, and then we'll get back into you. Those are powerful words. Will you come back with us tomorrow? Absolutely. That's great. Okay. I'll be there. Stay tuned to more Carolina people with uh, the Honorable Robinson Everett coming up next. You know, we thought the last 30 minutes was going to be all about Robinson Everett. It ended up being about his mother and his father and about him. You'll hear more about his father tomorrow. Come back with us and a lot more about Robinson Everett and his amazing mother, Catherine Robinson Everett. You'll hear some exciting instances of Reuben Oscar Everett taking on the Klan and getting their masks off their head. Come back tomorrow, 7 a.m., Carolina People with Robinson Oscar Everett.